Hello everyone, this is Tim, and I'm doing something a little bit different today. Inspired by Disson Val and Andre C. Martinez, I'm going to do some driving and talking. Forgive me if I'm not looking right at the camera, because, well, I'm driving. <laughs> so, I remember in uh, Andre C. Martinez's video, I kept thinking, oh man, this guy's going to hit a pole or smash it inside of a car or something. So I'm just going to pay attention to the road and do some talking. I was figured I wanted to just talk about my gaming history. I've alluded to it to some degree in some other videos, but I figured that I wanted to just, uh, you know, just talk about it here, do something a little bit different. You know, it's sort of uh, the path that I've traveled, so maybe this works out that I'm, uh, I'm driving down uh, roads and so forth, making turns, lefts and rights. So, where did Tim start out gaming? Well, my mom realized that I liked the animated Return of the King video by Rankin and Bass, and I watched that thing like crazy. That and uh, Flash Gordon and the Star Wars trilogy, that sort of stuff. And my sister liked The Last Unicorn. She loved the hell out of that thing. So I watched a lot of that stuff when I was growing up. So she realized that I really enjoyed fantasy, and she had heard that, you know, college kids and so forth were really into Dungeons and Dragons. So she bought me what I later learned was the Black Box D&D, &D, which I don't own anymore. It must have got thrown away, or we never really took care of things as kids, so it probably just got beat up. You know, the corners of the box is probably split off, and, uh, you know, it just ended up in the trash or something like that. So anyway, um, so I started out with Black Box D&D, &D, and when we were that young, we didn't realize that... Once you finish the adventures that came with it, that you can make up your own stuff. I know that sounds stupid now, but that's just how it, how it was. Me and my brother uh, took turns running whatever came with the box. You know, it had little fold-up cardboard figures that you can put, uh, you know, for your characters or the monsters. And it came with some, uh, you know, sample adventures, I think. And we played that until it ran out, and then it went on the shelf. And then later, my mom... You just realized how much fun we had with that. So, you know, where other kids might have gotten different D&D box sets, we got the Hero Quest board game. Now, the Hero Quest board game uh, was really cool because it came with these little plastic figures that I still think are great miniatures. If I was more of a miniatures using guy, I'd still be using them today. I still own them. And if I still see a Hero Quest board game in a Goodwill or Salvation Army, I always pick them up. I think I have two or three sets that were all sort of incomplete. So I think I think in, in buying three different sets, I have all the parts now. So we played that, and we actually ordered the additional dungeon levels that you could uh, order from that company. Uh, so that we played through all the ones that came with the original box set, and we played, I think, two more, I don't know, books of adventures. And for Hero Quest, they were pretty, they were almost like one-page dungeons for each one. So we played the hell out of that until uh, it ran out. And I remember in Hero Quest, I remember us making our own our own dungeons for it, which was cool. Uh, I, I guess we figured out that we could. I think, I think they actually suggested in the rules that you can make up your own stuff. So we did that, and then the next game we got was uh, the Lord of the Rings board game. And again, my, my mom was really great for introducing me to RPGs. She bought that as well because I like the uh, Return of the King animated uh, movie. All right, I'm going to stop here for a second and start up a little bit. All right, I guess we're back. Uh, make sure to turn the light on here. All right. So we're at, where I left off was the Lord of the Rings adventure game by Iron Crown Enterprises, or ICE. ICE put out uh, Middle Earth role-playing, Role Master in its various editions, and eventually High Adventure role-playing. They put out stuff like Space Master and you know other games like that too. So we played Lord of the Rings Adventure Game for a while, and actually we uh, kind of like Hero Quest. We bought the additional modules for the game uh, over the Misty Mountains Cold and oh, there was another one I can't think of it right now. But anyway, we uh, we played that until again we ran out of the modules and. You would think after Hero Quest we would know to how to make our own adventures, but no, still we didn't. Uh, we could do the, the dungeon levels for Hero Quest, but for Lord of the Rings it was just above our pay grade at the time, I guess. 
Um, so yeah, we played that until we finished it. And in the back of the Lord of the Rings adventure game, I believe there was a some sort of advertisement in the box where you can send away to get the Iron Crown Enterprises newsletter, price list, you know, something like that. And we got that, and it talked about Rollmaster. And at the time, you know, we wanted something more. We wanted additional adventures or additional things. And I think it was like 60 bucks at the time. You could buy, uh, this is Rollmaster uh, Standard System, RMSS, I think that's what it stands for, or what the abbreviation for it is. So we uh, <laughs> we got some money together from our allowances, birthday money, etc. And me and my brother both pitched in to buy the Rollmaster Standard System. And we were so excited when those books came. The covers of them, I think it was Angus McBride is the uh, the artist. There was one with like a you know a, a lion guy holding out his hand, and there's other ones uh, like the uh, the Arms Law. There was Arms Law, Spell Law, uh, and then just the 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 Rollmaster standard system, basically the character creation and some of the main rules for the game. And later on down the, the line, I got the Game Master Law, which I've actually done. A video uh, on on my channel. Also, Lord of the Rings adventure game. I've done a, a video on that as well. If you want to go back and check it. So, okay. So we played Rollmaster. Oh my! I don't even know how many years to assign to it. It was a a good many years. And we played that. Oh, we played that until pretty much when Magic: The Gathering came out. And it wasn't that uh, I stopped playing Rollmaster because Magic came out. It was just that our group had gotten a little bit older, some kids moved away, and you know, without anybody to play with, you know, without the internet to find new players, we were pretty much done. I believe my brother, however, kept running Rollmaster with some of his friends when I wasn't around. You know, I got a job, <laughs> slinging burgers at McDonald's was my uh, first job, but. Just talk a little bit about Rollmaster. We loved the hell out of the critical charts, the critical tables. Um, the character generation, we, we, we loved all the skills, the, but we did start to complain after a while with all the, you know, it felt like you were doing an accounting homework because some of the skills had three stat bonuses, some of them had two. And <laughs> there was an option in the game in Rollmaster where you could increase your stats. Well, the problem with increasing your stats, even though it's good because you can increase a bunch of skills at the same time, because all the bonuses start adding up, you have to go through all the skills and change the stat bonuses. And like I said, there's like two or three uh, <laughs> per skill sometimes. So it was kind of weird because normally in RPGs when you uh, level up your character, you're excited. <laughs> well, when we did it, we are like, yeah, we got another level. Ah oh, shit! Now we gotta add up all the bonuses. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that was just something funny about that. Uh, another thing uh, about Rollmaster was that we uh, always went down to the gas station where these two little old ladies used to work and used their photocopier. You know, it was like five cents a copy. It was the cheapest uh, cheapest photocopying place we could find in our local area that we could walk to or ride our bikes to. So we would throw our Rollmaster books in our backpack. And just head on down to the gas station, and you know we we'd have to save up some money for that too. You know we we drop like twenty dollars on uh, photocopying like the uh, weapons charts and the weapons critical tables. I don't know why we didn't realize this at the time though. A lot of them were very similar, like the like they, they would have like crush on the back or slashing or piercing. Some of the weapons would have two to two different ones, but I think at the time we just we liked having it all self-contained like. One paper, like let's say you had a rapier, you would have all the different listings of armor types, and then all the different, uh, you know, if you'd roll, you'd get a subtract their defense from your offense, and whatever you got, that's what you looked up on the table. Well, we like to just be able to look on the one side and then flip it over and see what the critical was on the, on the back side. I think I've talked to other people who said that in their games, the GM always looked these, these things up, but I guess we were ahead of our time in that. We had a little bit of delegation to the players. <laughs> yeah.
you know, they would figure out their own total and, uh, you know, that sort of thing. So we played Role Master, like I said, until Magic came out, and then I didn't really play RPGs for a while. Um, actually, I think when I played Magic for a couple years with some of my friends, I got to the point where I graduated high school. Uh, the summer after high school, I played the, the, the hell out of Magic. I would go to my friend's house, and he also bought Magic Boxes direct, so we got them a lot cheaper than a lot of other people could. And we, we would have, you know, I would, it wouldn't be unheard of for me to just go cash in my McDonald's check, make sure I had enough money for gas and my car insurance, and I'd just drop the rest of the money on Magic cards. And that reminds me that when we were playing Rollmaster, there used to be a hobby store called Bill & Waltz uh, in Greensburg. And I would go in there and do the same thing. I would get my McDonald's check, and I would just drop the whole thing because that was before I had my driver's license. I would drop the whole thing on Ral Partha, AD&D, you know, all those old uh, metal miniatures uh, packs that you could buy. So I have, I have a good collection of Ral Partha and other metal miniatures. So I go on to college, and the only game I played in college was Vampire the Masquerade. And it was only once that I played. I think I've also alluded to this in other games, but I'll talk about it here too. So, this group of vampire that play this game, they, uh, a very close-knit group, they were really into the in-depth role-playing. And at the time, I don't think I had experienced that at all, so it kind of freaked me out as a new player. And also, I think that we were just so different as people you know, they were very much into the golf culture, and, uh, you know, uh, they were just, they had different uh, belief systems than I did, and I really didn't know how to take them, and I don't think they really knew how to take me, I, I think they were glad to have another player, but at the same time, I think they just kind of felt that we were just different people, um, so, I don't know, I ended up picking a Salubri, because that's one of the options the GM storyteller gave me. And I just don't think it fit well with our group. But again, at the time, I didn't know Vampire at all. But I kind of wish, I kind of regret that I let that bother me and I didn't play with them anymore. I just went once. You know, I think I was so uncomfortable that they asked if I was coming back and I even just lied and say, yeah, I'll probably be back. But I just kind of had a feeling that I wouldn't be. I don't know. And I also had a friend that went with me. It was more of a changeling player. At the time, I never played that game either. But he was more freaked out than I was. So I kind of think in hindsight that he basically also influenced me not to go back. And without him being there, I probably would have tried it again. I'm the kind of guy that likes to give people a second chance. But I think his at his insistence, I didn't go back. So the rest of college, I didn't play any, any RPGs, which is kind of sad. And... I had my magic decks, and I really didn't play magic either. I uh, went to a local gaming store, and <laughs> they were all pricks. <laughs> I don't know how else to say it. I just I couldn't stand it playing any games with them. It was, it was kind of you know, infuriating. So after that, I came back home, played a little bit more Rollmaster, and then there was another dead period. I didn't play any, any RPGs. But then. 3rd edition D&D came out. And with 3rd edition, that was like sort of my reintroduction to Dungeons & Dragons. Um, as I told you before, the only real Dungeons & Dragons I had played at that point was Black Box D&D for a little while. And then after that, I played D&D, 3rd oh, edition, 3.5, for a long time. I think pretty much up to the point that 4th edition came out. Maybe like a year before. And then I pretty much uh, stopped playing that. And after that, the floodgates opened. I started buying RPGs. I started collecting them. Uh, games I would, you know, not even get a chance to play for years later. But, yeah, that's pretty much when the floodgates opened. All right, take another break, and uh, that's it. I'll talk to you guys later.